it's not just the economist who provides the advice that matters, it's also the policy makers, the lobbyists, the public, the public, you know, who, who should um, scrutinize what they listen to. And uh, if they don't understand something, if it's too complicated or if it doesn't make sense, well, you know, then uh, why do they follow the, uh, the, the Pied Piper? The better term for capitalism, to my mind, is, is the market economy model. Which, and I personally would even prefer the social market economy model, which is kind of the, 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 the buzzword the Germans love in particular, where you have um, the market a mechanism responsible for allocating resources, but uh, government setting the rules of the game and providing uh, goods and services. We had the time between 45 and 90 was the competition between communism and Western market economies. The coming decades will be the competition between state capitalism and a more social market economy model. And it's the more complicated challenge because the state capitalist system is the more successful one, is the better competitor. Economics matters because it, because it is about one of the fund fundamental aspects of our life. You know, it's, it's, uh, it looks into the question of how we make our livelihoods, how we, um, uh, how we can satisfy our basic needs. But of course, economics is about much more. It's about you know, the exchange between people in the marketplace. So it's another very fundamental human uh, desire and trait to exchange and interact. And it's about also putting to the best use, you know, the resources that we have on this planet. So economics is, is, is really fundamental for, for, for all of us. Economics as a science, I mean, looks at, at analyzes economic actions and actors and how they react to changing signals from prices and the market, kind of the microeconomic side and the macroeconomic side, it looks at the aggregates and how we, uh, you know, how, how things get aggregated and how the aggregates change, uh, you know, when behavior changes, when shocks happen, when the environment changes. I wouldn't call economics policy making as economic engineering. I, I think that's a deep misunderstanding and part of the problem of our times. Um, the, 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 it is true that a lot of what we do in economics is, is a practically a kind of, in, in economics as a science, is practically a kind of examination of what would happen with economic engineering. Say you raise government spending and what happens to aggregate demand and GDP and so on. Um, but that's actually, to my mind, part of the problem. Um, economic policy making is very rarely done with the desire to actually produce a certain precise change via a certain policy action, but it, it, is, it, it, is, it aims at achieving certain objectives, but it is the result of the interaction of the actors in the political process. And um, in that sense, uh, there are, of course, many economies, economists who, who think policymakers should behave like engineers, but they don't. And they don't have the knowledge and they don't have the incentives to do so. So this is part of the problem of our science and it's part of the, to my mind also, the reason of the widespread lack of success of our science because 
we tell policymakers to do one thing and then we are surprised that maybe they do something else instead of you know reflecting on what the incentives are what the marketplace is they're operating in um how and how how then so to speak policy should be designed and what policies would help so to speak this policymakers objective function and at the same time perhaps also receive, achieve the economic objectives so i mean this is i this is not black and white you know economists say a and policymakers to b uh, reality is is somewhere gray different shades of gray but i think it would do us a lot of good as economists if we uh, understood and acknowledged better the world policymakers are living and operating in interesting question um I think much of economics does indeed serve a common good and does help society in the sense that it provides conceptual frameworks and uh, data and empirical analysis um, to look at real world phenomena to understand real world phenomena better and from that perspective I think uh, much of economics perhaps not all of it but much of economics really provides value whether the um, you know marginal costs always uh, justify are always justified by the marginal benefits that's the that's a different matter but on the whole i would say it's good um what perhaps is uh, is 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 a challenge is is the normative part of economics where as i said as a reply to the previous question um we are um often extrapolating from our armchair world which which by definition and by necessity has to be simple so that we can kind of tease out can extract the 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 findings uh, you know the analytical findings and the messages if you know this is the world we are living in then you know this should be the response but we are not paying enough attention to the if in the sense that um you know we often give advice without uh without uh without uh, looking really at the world policy makers are living in and another challenge here is of course long term versus short term special interest versus general interest so some economists give special interest advice you know which then becomes a general interest uh, claim and some economists make suggestions for the long term which are difficult to implement in the short term and the other way around so so these are difficulties kind of of um extracting the maximum value of what economists do as analysis to my mind another excellent question um first let me start with what economics deal with today i mean what you are describing is is to a significant extent one branch of economics that admittedly today dominates i mean it's macro and macro and micro um but um the classical economists put much more emphasis on the market process and institutions and so to speak if you look at what does economics do the canon of economics uh i think i i would add these these keywords to that as really essential contributions for our understanding of uh you know why how economies work politics works and or not how or doesn't work um so so that's kind of like on the first point i i would emphasize that economics is not just you know about the efficient allocation of means to an end it's also about you know analyzing the processes the market processes the economic the, the market processes with the where the economic exchange of goods and services takes place and the political market processes where incentives also operate which brings me to the second real question of yours you know what is what, what about the issues that also matter and um i would say that um 
climate change environment is 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 in a way another public good externality uh, element uh, that has always been on the or maybe not always but for a long time been on the radar of economists but that has of course gained much more prominence with the debate about climate change and uh, the by now global shortages in 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 a healthy environment that have emerged so um so environmental economics is a, is is a long standing part, branch of economics um i've studied it already when i was a student that was many many years ago um but uh, it's become more prominent and it does and economics to my mind actually does provide an excellent toolkit to analyze this i mean you know i think it, without economics it would be it, it it you know without a proper application of economic thinking we will face great difficulties in mastering our environmental and climate challenges and i think uh, you know, i've been thinking about it for a while also because in the oecd i was uh, st- strongly involved in this area especially through the question of carbon pricing i was responsible for the tax side there and uh, also for trade because carbon pricing is the way where you say to say i mean you have a scarce good uh, which is difficult to to where, where you want to reduce consumption but it is difficult to achieve that because you know so far we have treated it like a free good and um, carbon pricing is in a way to to internalize the externalities on climate change and on you know other negative side effects that that uh, um, pollution and carbon uh, co2 has so um i think and that is now becoming in in more and more countries the the accepted way um that uh, we we can master the uh the the climate change challenge uh, of course there are economists also provide other instruments uh, in this area you know regulation and subsidies and so on uh which you know Uh, and like discussing trade offs you know carbon pricing is kind of a good compass but you know is it really good to let prices fluctuate all the way to the top or to the bottom because of some temporary factors that might actually have an inbuilt destructive effect on the market um so you know economists provide a lot of tools there um for the debate and they also can help you explain why for instance certain measures are less efficient you know that you get less bang for the buck you get less carbon prevention for the euro or the dollar than say through carbon pricing you know in germany we are very good at this by spending lots of money on uh, insulating buildings and subsidizing uh, in, in renewable energy without having uh, checked you know whether this is the best way to 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 spend the money in terms of uh, you know getting uh, climate change mitigation so economics pro- I, i i dwell a bit on this example because by extrapolation you know some of the other challenges you mentioned are different but in any case for all these challenges we can we can uh we provide a toolkit you know it's admittedly uh um you know it's admittedly an imperfect toolkit and to 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 kind of tease out messages we have to simplify so one always has to be careful but uh, it's a good toolkit and then you know as regards the other issues you mentioned i mean going beyond gdp for instance and going to well-being clearly i mean um you know if say a clean environment is part of the well-being index then um you know that economics can help kind of get a good uh, combination of you know prosperity and a clean environment um then we get into difficult issues you know even gdp is a, something that's difficult to measure something scientific like you know the pollution that's we can measure but we don't clearly understand the path of these things and how you know how, how much you know co2 emissions are really a possible and how we have we really we have a lot of uncertainty not so much about the measurement but about the um the, the impact uh of of the pollution there are other areas you know where we have a lot of a lot more problems with measurement happiness for instance you know ultimately we want to be happy and can economics say something about happiness a lot yes there is a happiness literature 
But one has to be a bit more careful that one doesn't kind of move into a brave new world type setting where you say, okay, I mean, if, the, uh, if happiness means you don't, are not depressed and are not worried, well, then let's all take Soma or, you know, some of these other drugs. And then for very little money, we're all very happy. So um, it's, um, it's, it's more complicated when the measurement of the goals is difficult, when then also you may have different theories on how to uh, achieve it. And, you know, you, you don't know which of the theories is really the, the one uh, um, uh, describing, so to speak, well, the problem, you know, like the, the pills theory versus the more integrated better life theory and so on. So, and then, uh, um, and then you have to look at the political incentives in the other areas, you know, what kind of incentives do then policymakers have in going back to environment. Um, you know, and policymakers are elected by voters and many of them may be craftsmen or, uh, you know, other people who say, I mean, if there's a lot of uh, money in this, you know, let's get some of it for us. And uh, so then you get building insulation programs and subsidies and stuff like that, or you, you get the uh, lobby of the uh, solar panel owners on roofs. So if you find it's uh, maybe not the most efficient way to uh, reduce carbon emissions, you will still find that a lot of people will hate you if you then want to reduce their subsidies. So um, uh, it's... Um, for the, so to speak, the less monetary and and measurable something becomes, the more difficult, to my mind, it becomes to really draw, draw clear lessons from an economic perspective. But in terms of behavioral patterns and and the role of constraints and the importance of efficiency, I think that that can be applied uh, to to many more areas. And I haven't now commented on any of the other ones you mentioned. If you want me to comment on any particular issue, I'm happy to do that. But, um, but I think as a principle, uh, it, it is a very good development that we are becoming um, much more sophisticated also in terms of what we actually want to achieve, achieve uh, as economists, you know, thanks to the feedback also from our populations who are not just happy anymore with getting say, more cars or more money or whatever. Well, there is a market for ad advice by economists. You know, if, uh, if that market is not perfect, and economists are held accountable to some extent. Say you advise um, a minister or um, an association, you know, it doesn't just have to be policymakers, it can be lobbies. And your advice is not comprehensible, you already have a problem and you're, you will probably find your market value to be very low very quickly. Then if your advice turns out to be leading to bad results, you might also be punished by the market and by the demand for your services, but maybe not because uh, memories are short and sometimes it's also difficult to allocate, you know, outcomes to measures. And that's often very murky. I mean, um, there, for instance, I mean, you know, if, if you look at, Issues like, um, like debt crisis. I mean, you know, if you if you see it as, uh, as as take the global financial crisis. I mean, um, some people warned beforehand, you know, of high levels of debt, of bubbles, and so on. They didn't have a high market value from their advice. While others, you know, warned more about, uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether. You know, house prices go up a lot and private debt, who cares? Interest rates are low, public debt also. And um, so then the crisis came. Um, and yeah, what happened to the people who gave the advice before the crisis? 
things became so topsy turvy that um, not really. I mean, it wasn't really asked. It was asked to some extent what what was the origin and why what what happened. But um, um, you know, you, you you didn't go and say, well, you know, because economist X told us it doesn't matter, you know, to have a housing bubble. You know, the, the, he has to pay a fine now or pay back his consultancy fees or pay a penalty for the publications. So it's very difficult um, because um, a lot of what is picked up as advice and analysis and advice, I should say analysis and advice, is not really picked up at the request of the economist who does it. And it's in a way part of the freedom of uh, analysis and speech, you know, to say what you think is the right thing. So uh, I would say, no, in, you, you can't hold economists accountable if they write nonsense or stuff that turns out to be nonsense exposed or if not nonsense, not practically relevant or even damaging. If people kind of give advice on the commercial basis, I would say there is some control through the market, but uh, it's always also an individual responsibility on the demand and supply side. You know, it's not just the economist who provides the advice that matters. It's also the policymakers, the lobbyists, the public, the public, you know, who, who should um, scrutinize what they listen to. And uh, if they don't understand something, if it's too complicated or if it doesn't make sense, well, you know, then uh, why do they follow the, uh, the, the Pied Piper? So um, I'm, uh, I, I believe, I mean, our whole system believes in, in a way the competence and autonomy of the individual. Now, we all know that's limited, our rationality is limited and so on. But if you, if you, don't, if you give up that principle, then you're lost. You know, if, say, just, if so to say, the public can now sue Keynes or Hayek for giving advice 80 years ago, which got us into trouble, you know, where would we be? So, um, so I, I, I think that principle of, uh, of, um, of responsibility on both sides, so to speak, of the market is, is, is very important. And, um, and, and as long as there is, so to speak, not severe misconduct, you know, you could have people who deliberately give wrong advice because they don't want to promote the objective that they were asked to promote, but something else. So you, have, you may have, like in corporates or in politics, you may have misconduct, you know, misrepresenting. And if, then, of course, I mean, you know, uh, fake, fake, uh, faked data, forged data, for instance, or deliberately uh, wrong conclusions. Um, there, there, I mean, but that's kind of the liability you have in a business interaction. That, I think, should always apply. But kind of uh, uh, liability for good or bad advice, uh, I think, is, is, uh, w would kill the market, so to speak, because uh, people would just simply not say anything and do anything anymore because there's just too, too many. It's, it's, it's too, uh, too difficult to, to, to find, so to speak, uh, to assess the quality of the advice and then uh, uh, actually... Uh, assign the liability or, or make people accountable. I mean, we see a bit of this now where people start saying, for instance, you know, Milton Friedman uh, is responsible for the excess uh, application of the profit motive, which I think is a gross simplification. And if you read Milton Friedman, it was he, he, what he said has been much more sophisticated than that. He may have said, or he, I, I understand him, you know, saying that the profit motive is perhaps, it's, it's, it's not a great motive. It's a bit like democracy. It's, it's, it's a very imperfect motive, but it's perhaps the best of the ones that could drive corporate behavior. And when I see that then, uh, you know, uh, Milton Friedman gets blamed, but what is the alternative? You know, if the alternative is some social good that is hard to measure and so on, you know, then what, what happens? The shareholders who have saved the money and put it in with the trust that, you know, it would be put to good use may find themselves expropriated because the manager suddenly say, sorry, forget about your profits. I'm doing now some good for society or the climate or whatnot, you know. And 
the policymakers may say, okay, I mean, you know, this means we can expropriate the shareholders and force companies to go in a certain direction. So, so this, this is just as an example how, 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 again, one has to look at the incentive effects of such uh, uh, um, conclusions. And my conclusion would be that um, given all the uncertainties and the lack of information and the incentive effects, I would not go that far except in the case of, so to speak, deliberate misconduct. Economics explains capitalism depending on how you define capitalism. <laughs> And um, I don't like the term capitalism too much because it's a bit loaded. Personally, I think it is unfairly negatively loaded because if you think about what the alternative is, socialism, you know, then I prefer capitalism over socialism. But the better term for capitalism, to my mind, is, is the market economy model. And I personally would even prefer the social market economy model which is kind of the, 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 the buzzword the Germans love in particular, where you have um, the market mechanism responsible for allocating resources, but uh, government setting the rules of the game and providing uh, goods and services, uh, public goods and services, and um, social safety nets, social insurance being one of those public goods and services. Where, um, uh, where, which makes the market economy a social market economy and where strong education systems provide opportunities to everybody and where good infrastructure provides opportunities to everybody. So social is not just an income distribution, uh, uh, um, that has not just an income distribution dimension, it also has an opportunity dimension to my mind. You know, you, what help is it if only the rich can get onto the freeways and uh, get good education, you know, you, 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 economically it's terribly inefficient and, and socially it is totally unsustainable. So the social market economy uh, is, is, so to speak, my uh, compass about, so to speak, what economists should strive for. Now that is a variance of a capitalist economic model but it is not robber baron capitalism or the jungle, the Hobbesian jungle without rules. So the term is, uh, and it's used also sometimes to, to discredit certain uh, ways of looking at, uh, e at the economy and, and economic policy making, and, and we should be, be careful with that, yeah. If you speak, if you mean by cap, global capitalism, the, the compass of a social market economy model, I think under different terms, because you, you know, the Anglo-Saxons don't use the word social market economy model, but, um, uh, but that concept and compass, I think will stay with us for a long time. Whether more countries will follow uh, on that route and implement that system is difficult to say because um, we have, um, I think we have two challenges. The first one is that in many or in all of our countries, the model is not done in a perfect manner. You know, I mean, the markets don't function perfectly. The governments provide public goods and services, but not in a perfect manner. Some better, some less good. And, um, and we have new challenges that arise all the time. The climate change challenges is, is, is probably the most, apart from the military, you know, I mean, that we don't hit each other over the head and kill each other, thanks to our, also thanks to our prosperity, because, you know, we would all be dead very quickly if we started hitting each other over the head today, given the degree of specialization of our economies. You know, nobody knows how to farm anymore. We are way too many people and so on. So um, that, I think, the, the, the global capitalism, you call it, or the widespread application of a social market economy type model has, I think, already helped 
reduce the threat of one of the most formidable, uh, one of the worst human sufferings to war. I, I, I really think that um, our economic model has helped uh, prevent um, more wars. And when you look at where the wars take place, then it's usually very local ones and typically in poorer countries, unfortunately, where it's actually still possible to fight such wars. Um, so that, I think, as we get richer, the incentives to engage in war falls. This, the newest really super formidable challenge is probably climate change, where in a way we all globally, or at least like at least 60, 70% of the global economy have to you know, cooperate to, to master that. And there it's um, using, to my mind, market instruments, the capitalist model to master this in the best way. But you need policymakers and international and international collaboration to do this. The market alone clearly will not solve this. And, uh, but the market provides instruments that, that can help us solve it in the least, so to speak, uh, um, with the least trade-offs. Because, you know, while, uh, yeah, so that, that I think, um, and then, yeah, the pandemic shows us that we also have to keep an eye on some other things. We have become extremely vulnerable um, for, for certain events like pandemics, um, where the risk is also that the baby is pouring out with the bathwater because um, uh, kind of more state controlling systems like China maybe find it easier to deal with challenges like the pandemic because they find having, they, for them it's easier to limit individual freedom to an extent that it prevents the uh, pandemic from spreading or it can help eradicate it. And so, um, so the, the, the market economy model with the political system attached that we have of individual freedom and autonomy of consumers and so on is not best at dealing with all challenges. And it is conceivable that people think, okay, for, it, is, it is much more important to solve the pandemic than to preserve our individual freedom and the market economy and we allow the government to lock us all up. And one of the worst conclusions after this pandemic would be exactly that, that people see, ah, the Chinese were better able to deal with this, so maybe they have the better economic model. Um, and it's because it's not capitalism that, you know, it's, it's the combination of the market economy of capitalism with our individual freedom that makes us less able to, to deal with it. So it is possible that our system, you know, I mean, we all say COVID has been the worst, is the worst crisis in a century, and that's true economically, but it could be much worse because the death rate from the infection could be not 1%, but 10 or 50, and then things would really collapse. And then afterwards, you know, what conclusions would we draw from that? So I think we are actually quite lucky that we got a pandemic like this one, um, where, where we can kind of uh, still maintain um, a system that uh, preserves the individual freedom and uh, allows to also use the market economy model to solve it. And I hope this will be the conclusion afterwards. But you see already from the discussions that we are leading about more role of the state, more public spending, um, that you know, drawing the right conclusions is not so obvious. I mean, are our medical systems really underfunded or is the money just poorly targeted? You know, is, is, um, is, is, uh, uh, is it market failure or government failure? And if it's both, or if it's mainly government failure, then how can we improve the functioning of our governments? You know, and if the government was the problem of the at the, at the root of the crisis, more spending, more government may not solve this. And it has other trade-offs, you know, indebtedness. So we might stumble and tumble into the next debt crisis. Um, given you know how the numbers are developing so and then if we do that thanks to COVID, and then um we have problems in europe that 
we might, you know, for the time being, we have found solutions. But uh, it's not, it, there is no certainty that our economic model will become the global economic model for economic reasons, because we may not be able to handle certain problems well and we may not draw the right conclusions. And then we have system competition where leaders of other approaches may also invest time and energy to preserve their privileges, you know, as dictators or whatever, because they want to um, eliminate a competitor. I mean, our system is a competitor. And we are not competing in a fair political global market, but we are competing in a market where some countries may invest a lot of money to kind of uh, undermine our systems. So my, in short, my answer is no, there is no predetermined path, but uh, it speaks for a close, um, uh, um, a, a close and good analysis of what, so to speak, su successful systems are and an alertness by our governments to improve uh, for, their own, for the sake of their own survival. But individual politicians, of course, have very little incentive to do that. But as a, as a society, we have a huge incentive to do so. so uh, and that requires, of course, good analysis uh, and a good historic thinking also, which is sometimes a bit neglected. You know, we, we kind of operate on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, instead of kind of taking a bit longer view. But uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm still optimistic that, and, and in a way, the fact that a system like the Chinese one, you know, which uh, adopted a lot of market mechanisms and incentives, to uh, be successful and survive and uh, make its population better off. And in many countries, this has been also on the, tr the transition then to more free societies. I mean, if you look at Germany in the 19th century, I mean, you know, it had rudimentary elements of democracy, uh, but it was not a politically free system. And we went through terrible turmoil in the following decades. Um, but uh, uh, I think there is a chance that um, over time, our system, uh, our system, um, uh, our market economy system will prevail more. Well, but, but let give me a minute because I think to synthesize key messages from different angles is always good. Um, Capitalism as such, um, no. Capitalism defined as the system of reckless, uncontrolled rule of the market where, or, and with, with elements of the right of the, you know, the jungle where the stronger dominates, no. That system will not prevail. And frankly, I think it doesn't really exist in that form anymore. I mean, the, 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 the Manchester capitalism, that's history long ago. Um, the, the social market economy model where it is applied with diligence, um, uh, uh, taking into account, so to speak, from the micro and the macro level of our constraints, I think has a good chance to prevail as the, you know, the best possible system. It's always best possible. And it will differ across countries because of culture, because of history, because of institution. There is a risk that the state capitalist system um, will prevail, not prevail, will be seen as a success story to copy by more countries in the coming decades. But I think Anybody who wants to follow that model has to understand also why and how it works to some extent in China and on what conditions and why those why it might not work elsewhere. So I, I think I think that um, that is in a way, you know, like we had the time between 45 and 90 was the competition between communism and Western market economies. The coming decades will be the competition between state capitalism and a more social market economy model. 
And it's the more complicated challenge because the state capitalist system is the more successful one, is the better competitor because it, it you know, the, the socialism ignored the, the, the lessons of micro and macroeconomics, you know, soft budget constraints on the macroeconomic side and ignoring incentives on the micro side. But state capitalism doesn't do that to the same extent. It does to some extent because it, it keeps people out of the political market or it keeps their involvement very controlled and very limited. Um, and that, to, to my mind, economic freedom without political freedom is, is very difficult to marry. So I don't think that they will succeed, but it will be a great competi competitor and a great temptation, a great temptation too, in many countries, perhaps even more so in developing and emerging countries to follow that model. So we are doubly challenged internally to improve our own countries and externally <clears throat> to win in that, in that competition.